On the chaotic Mexican border, Texas troops accused of blocking the rescue of drowning immigrants. Turns out that just wasn't true. Here at home, Houston's new mayor makes clear his policy on the homeless, saying they have no right to camp on city streets. And a thousand miles to the north, Former President Donald Trump scores a crushing victory in the Iowa caucuses, leaving little doubt who rank-and-file Republicans want at the top of the GOP ticket. I'm Greg Grugan, and welcome to Watch Your Point, where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, Bob Price, associate editor of Breitbart, Texas. Next up, former Houston City Council member Sue Lovell. In the three spot, education and public safety advocate Paul Castro. Batting cleanup, Holly Hansen, political writer for the Texan. And closing us out, Marcus Davis, acclaimed restaurateur and host of Fish, Grits and Politics. Let's begin. Moving quickly with a measure meant to better attack Houston crime, Mayor John Whitmire this week announced his intention to consolidate and better coordinate the resources on hand by merging Metro's police force into HPD under the command of Chief Troy Fenner. We're working out the details as I talk, and uh, no one has to worry about losing their job. It's a force multiplier. We got to use other departments, and Metro has a, a large uh, population, a large police force, about 280. I've lived here when we had a park police and an airport police, and we rolled them under HPD. So we can divide up the city and make sure no community goes unprotected. And the new mayor didn't stop there, confirming to Fox 26 a labor agreement with the city's long-suffering firefighters is in the works, should happen within two months and by necessity could involve taxpayers taking on new debt to pay the seven years of back wages and benefits denied this large group of first responders by former Mayor Sylvester Turner. We will have some tough negotiations, but we're all in this together and they understand that. Big number, could bonds be involved? I would not rule out anything at this point. Big number, we've got to pay for it. And uh, we've actually used bonds in previous settlements. The settlement bonds, actually, what it's called. So we'll see how that turns out. But we're we're going to have a contract with the firefighters. It's going to be fair to firefighters and fair to the public. Panel two major moves underway. So I'm going to ask, what is your point, Sue Lovell? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, you know, he's hard at work. He's keeping his campaign promises. I think the idea about Metro is a good idea. There's a lot of details to work out. Um, but, you know, it's thinking outside of the box how we can move forward on these issues. With the firefighters, it's great news for the firefighters and their families that they're negotiating and they will come to a settlement. And more than likely, it probably the payment is in some form of a bond where you can spread out the payments over a long period of time. And, it, and, it, and it's not what Mayor Turner used to say, which, oh, it was going to come out of the general fund, it was going to bust the general fund. That was never true. So I'm glad to hear Mayor Whitmire now telling the truth. Bob Price, you follow law enforcement pretty closely. What do you think of this merging the separate police force from Metro into a unified command? Well, I think it makes a lot of sense. The, there's been a lot of duplication and overhead in, in having two different departments. You've got to manage both of those departments. You can merge that together and have a little bit more efficiency. But there's also been an exodus from police forces, not just in Houston, but across the nation. And so to bring more resources into the HPD is probably a good situation. I think the mayor hit the ground running, although it's kind of easy to look like you're doing a lot when the previous mayor was doing nothing but kicking the can down the road. All right, Paul Castro, you're a public safety advocate. Uh, what do you think of this idea of merging, you know, several hundred officers in, into HPD and, and pushing their mission out into the neighborhoods? I think it's a great first start. Um, if you look back 25 years, HPD has fewer officers today with more people to watch over than they did 25 years ago. Uh, the ratio between one officer to number of citizens uh, has increased. So we used to be about 350, we're now at about 480 per officer. So 
what I understand from talking with uh, people in law enforcement is that means that they are now essentially just responding to events versus proactively patrolling the streets, getting to know the citizens, um, adding these 280 won't even get us back up to where we were and it's still a great first step, very much support it. All right, Holly, we've been talking about the pending balloon note that taxpayers are gonna have for many years on this show. It looks like it's showing up. Uh, your reaction to the mayor's uh, initiatives here? <laughs> well, it's nice to see him moving forward very quickly on this issue because it should have been solved years ago instead of uh, languishing for so long in the courts and so forth. Um, unfortunately, it is going to have a high price tag. It's nice to see Mayor Whitmire looking at creative ways to finance that. Um, and it does prompt discussions about the long-term e economic feasibility of some of these programs. I think mm -hmm. there's a case to be made for uh, uh, government workers who are in dangerous jobs like firefighters and police officers to be in these kind of defined benefit pension programs um, but there needs to be a discussion about maybe other workers who are not in such dangerous positions and can work to the full age of retirement and whether or not those kinds of programs are sustainable um, Whitmire has a lot to discuss when it comes to finances in the city of Houston all right Marcus Davis you have plenty of skin in this game you run a business here your family's here you've got legions of friends mm -hmm. and people you care about here uh, your impression of, uh, of these two initiatives and, and I'm a taxpayer and citizen. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, look, uh, both Bob and Holly brought up great points, right? This can has been kicked down the road by several mayors, and uh, it should have been solved years ago over several administrations. And one thing that it does prove, and I've mentioned this on this program time after time, the money has not been there. There's been a lot of discussion of what should have happened, but the reality of it, what, what, what Mayor Whitmire is saying is we've got to go and create something for this money because the money has never been there and that's the truth of the matter and it's unfortunate that the previous mayor and the firefighters got into this uh, this tiff where now we're coming to the, the, this head but that money that we're going to have to pay has always been the money we're going to have to pay and that's the point that Houstonians have to come to a, rea a, a, a reality of Houston has to invest in Houston in order for Houston to be the best Houston it can be. And we're not going to get around it without coming out of our pocketbooks. Sue, so, uh, and you keep a close eye on City Hall. Did uh, the previous mayor spend the money on other stuff? Was there, because there was lots of money flowing in through the federal government, through pandemic aid. Uh, every year, uh, the amount of revenue the city gets has grown. Uh, did he just choose not to spend this money? What he chose to do was not sit down and negotiate for seven years, which is, in essence, kicking it down the road and not getting it done. And when that happens, things accumulate. I mean, it's like a bill. If you just kick it down the road and don't pay it well, over seven years, there, there's a lot of accumulative things that happen that you still have to pay for at the end of it, and that's what happened. Paul, uh, the mayor dealt with his first weather emergency this week. We had zero people die zero people die and 2.3 million uh, so I guess you could rack that up as a win yeah absolutely I think uh, I heard people say well nothing happened well the reason nothing happened hey. is because we took precautions <laughs> right and so minor things happened but in a city that doesn't have you know trucks that roll and drop sand and salt uh, I think it was great that there were so few you know injuries to citizens and, and injuries to infrastructure or, or property so it was, a, it was a big win I think one of yeah, those precautions was closing the school absolutely <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna talk more about that later still to come deadly chaos continues on the border as Texas troops fend off false allegations they denied rescue to immigrants drowning in the Rio Grande and in our Sunday survey we're asking viewers a tough question do you believe it's the responsibility of Texas troopers and state guardsmen to risk their own lives to save immigrants who've been warned not to cross the river? Tell us what you think on our webpage, fox26houston.com. Just click on poll at the top of the page or tell 26 using our news app. But up next, a clear message to the homeless from Houston's new mayor who says camping on our streets must come to an end. They need a place, a shelter to go to. And when we have a shelter for them, they need to use it. And we don't need to let activists or other interfere with sound, safe, healthy plans for the homeless. 
Mayor John Whitmire making additional news telling business leaders that Houston's homeless simply do not have the right to camp out on city streets and sidewalks. As you heard, the mayor also appears fully committed to providing a workable alternative for the unhoused. Panel, this is clearly one of those chronic challenges on which we can hope for significant progress if not perfection. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Holly, because this is a national issue. Yes, it is. And it has to, it, it parallels a, an issue that's going to come before the Supreme Court this year out of Washington State Grants Pass versus Washington and whether or not there's a constitutional right to be able to camp in public places. What Whitmire is tapping into is the concern that by allowing this public camping, you can't really help these people who are homeless and you're placing the general public in jeopardy. When you have these anti-vagrancy laws, then you can push these people into treatment facilities and uh, services that will allow them to get off the streets in a more permanent way. Okay, Marcus Davis, the homeless uh, are in and around one of your primary businesses all the time. I know you have a big heart, uh, but you know, what do you make of what the mayor said? You know, it, it, it's a fine line. Right, it's a fine line between uh, humanity and humanity. Right, you have to have the, the the humanity for the person that's on the street, and you have to have the humanity for the person that are vi that's visiting the businesses and the business owner all at the same time. It's not an easy fix, and I hope that the best practices mm -hmm. will be studied, and I hope that the mayor will implement those practices in order to, benef to benefit everyone that that that's involved. Folks on the streets need need help. And they, we have to help them, and they have to want to have, want to get help. So it, it's not an easy pill to swallow. So this is not a new problem, and it's not going to be completely fixed. It's just not in the human condition, right? <laughs> no, it's very complicated. And I, what I took that the mayor was saying was about the activists is that it wasn't an insult. It was, look, this is our responsibility as a city and a government to do this, not your responsibility. We shouldn't have activists doing this because we should be taking responsibility uh, and coming up with a solution. Yeah, the mayor's talked about, Paul, that homeless have kind of taken over the downtown library mm -hmm. as, as a as a shelter place thoughts uh, about what you've heard from the mayor yeah so I, I I know that we get impacted our schools right down from Pierce elevated and mm -hmm. encampments there and we've had homeless people who we appear to see you know as having mental health issues who wander around campus defecate you know in our backyard um, uh, walk into our fenced in area and we have to push them out um, and when we call you know, HPD being understaffed doesn't respond necessarily really quickly to that. I'm really excited about possibly moving forward and helping those people. We're going to leave it there. Up next, a huge win for the Republican frontrunner after dominating the field in the Iowa caucuses. Is there any lingering hope Donald Trump's bid for the nomination can be derailed? Most importantly, we want to thank the great people of Iowa. Thank you. We love you all. What a turnout. What a crowd. Former President Donald Trump racking up a massive victory in the Iowa caucuses, although clearly the brutal winter weather impacted participation with only 15 percent of the state's registered Republicans showing up last Monday to cast ballots. That said, it's hard to deny the uh, front runner's dominance earning more votes in the Hawkeye state than his three rivals combined. In the meantime, third place finisher Nikki Haley has been polling well in New Hampshire, where she is hopeful of at least slowing down the Trump train. And the question before Americans is now very clear. Do you want more of the same? No. Or do you want a new generation of conservative leadership? Panel, let's just assume, and it's a big assumption, that Haley prevails in the less Trump-friendly Granite State. Would that be a game-changing for the race or just a speed bump in the former president's journey to a third nomination? Bob Price has his thumb clearly on the pulse of the Republican base. What's your assessment? Well, I think your analogy of the speed bump is probably the most accurate thing. It's interesting that, that uh, Nikki Haley says that it's time for a new generation of conservative leadership when she's going to New Hampshire and trying to bring in the moderate and Democrat vote to come in and propel her to some sense of, of outperforming expectations. Uh, it's it, not going to bode well for her when she goes to the next primary in South Carolina 
her home state where she was governor and uh, you know Tim Scott who she appointed to the Senate has endorsed Donald Trump it, it's not looking well for her at all as the campaign moves forward and uh, speed bumps probably the the most natural thing I think I said very early on in this that it was Donald Trump's race to lose and despite all all of these prosecutors who are trying to do election interference to stop him his momentum all they've done is is firmly implant him as the nominee for the Republican Party Holly you agree with that yeah, I couldn't agree more with Bob on this one. You know, Haley is is popular, but she does have a ceiling of support within the Republican Party. In New Hampshire, she's obviously going to draw on those independent voters who are fatigued with both parties' apparent nominees, and uh, but and that uh, you know doesn't bode well for the general election. But I don't think she gets much out of a New Hampshire showing. Um, what uh, some of these candidates may be vying for is a second place uh, position. Um, uh, that would put them in a position in case Trump is indicted on some sort of criminal offense. Uh, but that's that also is a long shot, I think. I guess you mean convicted, right? Con yes. <laughs> right? Sorry, he's got, sorry. He's got yes. plenty of indictments. Yes, indictments. Uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not dealing right. with this topic without letting Marcus Davis have a word. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I had several words, but Bob took, took most of them because I thought it was hilarious to watch Tim Scott endorse uh, mm. Donald, Donald, Donald Trump being that, that Nikki Haley was the one that pointed him. And I also thought it was interesting in the words she used about new conservative leadership. I think it should be new con woman leadership. Nikki Haley is a con. If you watch her placate to the audiences that she's in front of, she's made statements like there is no racism in America. America's not a racist country. She made uh, other statements, depending on the audience, about the, the Civil War. It just depends on the audience that she's talking to, where she's vacillating. And it's obvious that she's just doing it for, she's going along to, to, to get along. And I think some people are seeing uh, through that. Paul, we've seen that polls show uh, Nikki against Biden, uh, Nikki plus 12, mm -hmm. uh, much tighter margin if it's Biden versus uh, Trump. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't seem to factor in with a lot of these Republican voters. Yeah, I think people I've talked to here in Texas who are moderate Republicans are hoping that someone stays in the race and they all seem to like Haley up until the March primary here. If they do that, I think you would at least have people who could cast a vote. Uh, from what I've read and understood, the primary vote will drop off about half if, if there's not a contested race. And so I'm hoping that they step in. I think that would also affect a lot of down ballot measures. All right, we're leaving it there. When we come back, Casting blame for the death toll in Uvalde. A long-awaited Justice Department investigation confirms a costly cascade of law enforcement failures. Had the law enforcement agencies followed generally accepted practices in an active shooter situation and gone right after the shooter to stop him, lives would have been saved and people would have survived. Attorney General Merrick Garland telling us all what we already knew, that the law enforcement response to a heavily armed gunman at Uvalde's Robb Elementary was confused, incompetent, and cowardly. Garland's assessment sums up a 600-page Justice Department report and triggered from U.S. Senate candidate Roland Gutierrez a call for extreme restrictions on the sale of AR-15 semi-automatic rifles. Gutierrez represents Uvalde in the state Senate and felt compelled to describe body cam video of the mass murder scene. Her whole face just gone. I promise you, I know Dan Patrick hasn't seen those videos, and this governor hasn't seen those videos, or the Speaker of the House, or Ted Cruz, or anybody else. They refuse to see what the devastation and the destruction that this gun does. But they also refused to acknowledge that refrain, that the cops were afraid of the gun. Panel, we've been here before. Does the proliferation of this semi-automatic rifle render us collectively safer or more endangered? Uh, you can answer that, Paul, or you can talk about uh, this report from the perspective of a school administrator. Yeah, so it's horrifying. Um, there are 21 dead people, 17 injured. Of the 21 dead, 19 were students, two were teachers. Uh, the report showed that there were six different episodes of gunfire, okay? Six different episodes of gunfire, each of which should have prompted law enforcement, who at the time were in the building, to have done something. 
And we don't know, and we may never know, were there lives that were lost in each one of those episodes where the gunman saw a body moving, the gunman saw a child uh, fidgeting a little bit, and may have been able to survive. So that's part one, and that's horrific and terrible and should have been fixed. The second part was the utter lack of responsibility by those who were there and responding caused injured people to be loaded onto buses, dead bodies to be put in ambulances, and for people who just, no one seemed to ever take responsibility for the scene. Okay, so there was not a single person among the hundreds of people there who was able to say, you know what, we're going to use some common sense here, and here's how we're going to triage the event. That utter breakdown is not being addressed right now. There are a ton of responses that have been, you know, put into this Justice Department result, uh, report, but no one's talked to us about it yet. And, and uh, again, what we get told is it's your responsibility to make sure your building's secure. That's wonderful. That's great. And where's the money to make that happen? We can't afford a security guard at our campus, and so we're, we're doing the best we can, as are many districts across the state. Bob, I uh, want you to respond to Gutierrez. <clears throat> well, First off, he doesn't know what the governor or the attorney general or Senator Cruz or the Speaker of the House, he doesn't know what they've seen or what they haven't seen. Uh, I think that was a pretty political statement that had no basis in fact. That said, this, this report is, is very damning. It, it, it uh, clearly lays out a complete lack of command and control of the situation. Uh, cowardice is a very strong word that, that you know, people... The first officers that got there were injured by by the gunfire, and they pulled back into what they determined to be a barricaded shooter situation and not an active shooter situation. That turned out to be a very flawed decision, uh, a very bad decision. But nobody, there were hundreds of law enforcement there from, from the city, state, federal level. Nobody took command and control of that situation. and. It, secured the perimeter. They didn't take care of, of dealing with the parents that were there. They didn't take care of dealing with the injured. They didn't take, they spent way too much time evacuating and they didn't do what their primary directive is, which is to stop the shooter. 20 seconds. Yeah, welcome to the party. Uh, I have stated for years the, no, the amount of incompetence and the amount of coward that exists amongst police departments. I've said it when Philando Castile was shot. I've said it when Tamir Rice was shot. So welcome to the party of knowing that police officers have the capacity to be uh, incompetent and, and cowards. With that being said, the cowardly act of not acting on the federal level, state level, in order to do something about this. Yes, it was a political statement to say that they haven't seen it, the video, but if they've seen that video and they still haven't acted on this, coming from a gun owner, then shame on us and them. We're going to talk more about it in overtime. Still ahead, as America's so-called leaders fiddle, the Texas border burns with deadly attempted crossings, false allegations, and no real solution to the ongoing crisis. Anguished voices on the Rio Grande filled with fear and undeniable desperation. Real human beings risking and sometimes losing their lives in a bid to cross into these United States. The crisis reached yet another crescendo with claims that Texas troops blocked federal border patrol agents from going to the rescue of drowning immigrants near Eagle Pass. We have learned since that those incendiary allegations just weren't true that the immigrant mother and two children who ultimately perished in the water did so well before Border Patrol sought access to a state-controlled Riverside Park where Texas Guard troops restrict access. Panel Governor Greg Abbott is not backing down, and sadly, I think it's safe to say this tragedy will be repeated over and over unless President Biden and Congress somehow summon the will to take decisive, permanent action. Holly, uh, you've read the reports here. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that was a false narrative that was put out ahead of that uh, that story and the truth coming out that they had drowned on the Mexico side of the border or of the river there. Um, what's interesting is that since Biden took office, there have been at least 546 drownings known in that particular area. They don't make the news because they weren't able to blame Governor Abbott or Texans for that problem. Um, the problem is that these people are incentivized to come to the United States in, through illegal entry, points of entry. Um, they're willing to risk their lives because they know that once they get across the river and reach American soil, they'll be given funds, they'll be given phones, they'll be transported across the country, and it's a huge incentive. And the administration is not securing the border. It is a chaotic and dangerous situation for those who wish to come here for legitimate reasons. Paul, you have uh, family uh, in border enforcement. Take 30 seconds. Uh, what are you hearing? What's your perspective? Uh, I think two things can be true at the same time. Uh, but what I would ask is everyone start with a position of dignity, uh, the same care and concern we give towards the people who, um, you know, uh, serve our food, uh, clean our homes, take care of our children. Those are the people who are coming across the border just, you know, years later. I do think the border needs to be shut down. I do think that Biden is failing. I do think that uh, at the same time, I think that there should be at least an, a measure of dignity paid to the people once we do bring them together. Yeah, apparently our viewers anyway have have, have reached a saturation point. 95% in our poll said uh, they don't have the responsibility to go save those people because they've been told don't do it. I think that's just a measure of frustration, uh, Bob, don't you? Well, the reason they've been told not to do it is because we had a, a Texas National Guardsman drown trying to save somebody who turned out to be a drug trafficker coming across the river. The, what you heard in that video was a crime being committed. The crime was child endangerment. You heard that baby crying in there. If you or I, any of us, took our child through that frigid water to cross the river, it dragged them through razor wire to get into this country, you'd be charged with child endangerment. We don't charge these migrants with child endangerment. We bring them in. The Biden administration buses them up and releases them into these little tiny border communities like Eagle Pass, Texas. And then you get these whiny baby mayors up in sanctuary cities like Denver and, and Chicago and New York City who cry about getting a few thousand migrants from Governor Abbott when he's getting millions, when they're getting millions of migrants from Joe Biden's border policies. Three years ago today, Joe Biden created this problem when he walked into the Oval Office and signed the executive orders reversing the highly successful programs put in place by President Donald Trump. They were told this was going to happen. They made a deliberate decision to do it, and this is the consequence. Henry Cuero didn't say anything about the hundreds of migrants that you talked about that d drowned in the river. Right. 30 seconds, Marcus. We're at another impasse here. Yeah. Now, there's hope that they can leverage aid to Ukraine and Israel but uh, to get something going on. Do you think Congress or this administration has the will to do what's right on the border? Um, I, I don't. I don't, simply because, I, Bob, I agree in part with what you said. Uh, what I heard was a cry for freedom. What I heard was a, was a cry of desperation. What, the question of being asked about whether or not police officers have the, the responsibility to risk their lives. No, but human beings have a responsibility of being humane, right? And it's a terrible situation. And unfortunately, this cry of desperation, a lack of humanity, we're watching politicians play football with this subject, with this topic, with this issue. We're going to talk more about it. Still ahead, to avoid telling the truth under oath, our state's top cop is now conceding in court that he illegally retaliated against his whistleblowing staffers. But up next, Harris County District Attorney making the case for a third term in office and accusing her opponent of duping the voting public. Welcome back. It is my belief that there is no race more critical to the future of our community than the March 5th primary election for Harris County District Attorney. Having substantially reduced the massive backlog of criminal cases accumulated during the brutal years of pandemic and crime wave, our city's top prosecutor, Kim Ogg, believes she's deserving of the public's trust. You want to keep this job. Tell us why. Because I'm a Houstonian, Greg, and I want to make my county safer than it has been. We can be the safest county in the country. With Whitmire now in the driver's seat as mayor, uh, with 
judges, I think, having a fuller understanding of the impact of those bail decisions, in some part because of your shows. I think we've got a reason to be hopeful, and I've got unfinished business. So I want to be your DA and everyone's DA for a third term because we've got important cases pending. We've got a jailhouse full of violent offenders, including 800 murderers, and I've got work to do. Let's talk about reducing the caseload. You made significant progress? We have. Since I reported our decrease by 21% last April, we've come down from a high of about 145 to 50,000, if you include the juvenile cases, down to 105,000 cases. We're now at post-Harvey pre-pandemic levels. It reflects about 130% work each year, not just our lawyers doing a hundred percent work, clearing a hundred percent of the cases, but they've actually chopped away at almost 30 percent. Explain why in your role as the chief law enforcement officer of Harris County, uh, you have to be party blind, especially when it comes to issues of public integrity. The notion that some would have me turn a blind eye to a crime simply because it was committed by a Democrat is not just offensive, it's dangerous. It's really dangerous thinking. Look, our viewers are intimately aware of the details surrounding the bid rigging case uh, connected to the Elevate Strategies contract and uh, the subsequent indictment of three high-ranking officials within Judge Lena Hidalgo's administration. Your opponent, Sean Tier, is currently employed by a law firm representing her former chief of staff, Alex Triantafilis. Do you see any conflict of interest there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have grave concern about my opponent's ethics. He solicited the county judge's endorsement knowing full well that her staff is under indictment and charged with six felonies, three of them are, and that the investigation is ongoing because of missing documents. And still solicited her endorsement while never disclosing to the public that he was a member of the defense team. It's Prosecution 101, it's called the conflict of interest. We're supposed to avoid it. The fact that he would run for the top law enforcement official in such a compromised position is frightening. It's obvious to me that he's not ethical and that there very well could be a deal. But the real qualifications are about the candidate's character. And I think that's what our Houstonians have to realize and need to know is that sometimes when you make hard decisions like prosecuting people in your own party or even prosecuting police officers, it's not popular. The DA's job is not homecoming queen. The accusations against me were basically that I prosecute Democrats. Guilty as charged. I also prosecute Republicans, Libertarians, Green Party members, if there's evidence to show they committed a crime. Back our What's Your Point crew locked and loaded to thoroughly unpack this evolving battle to be Harris County's top prosecutor. Welcome back. We've just heard incumbent Harris County District Attorney Kim Ogg throw a few very heavy punches at her Democratic challenger and former employee, Sean Tier, who has aligned himself with County Judge Lena Hidalgo. Panel, we look forward to welcoming candidate Tier on this program in the very near future. But in the meantime, what did you make of the incumbent's spirited case for re-election? I'm going to start with you, Sue Lovell. You know Democratic politics. You've known Kim Ogg a very long time. I have. Um, I thought it, it's um, what she said is exactly true and right, that she was elected to be law and order, and it didn't matter if you're Republican, if you're a Democrat, wh whoever you are, if you've broken the law, then she's going to come after you, and that's what she did. And that's why you're seeing in the party some dissension, especially from uh, Judge Hildago's camp, because she dared to go and indict some of Judge Hildago's um, employees for um, bid rigging. And, and now Chantier uh, went to Hildago to get an endorsement, and Hildago gave him the endorsement because she's mad that her employees <laughs> were indicted by the, the current um, district attorney. So Kim, I thought Kim was a very good message, exactly why she's a good district attorney and should be reelected. 
All right, Paul Castro, uh, everybody knows your history, and you had uh, interplay with this district attorney. Your uh, thoughts, assessments? Yeah, so I think that what Kim Ogg has done to reduce the backlog, which is so important to moving cases forward, clearing cases, was, you know, her Herculean almost. Um, Kim Ogg's sympathies lie with victims, and I think that is critically important. Most people don't want to imagine the day where something really terrible, something violent occurs to them or someone in their family. Kim has had that experience herself, and therefore I think her thoughts, her behaviors are aligned with protecting our community, protecting citizens. From what I've seen from Sean Tier's campaign, his uh, loyalties and interests lie with defendants. And that's great, but fly that flag and then allow our citizens to make the decision as to which, de uh, which direction to go. Holly, you've reported on this. Yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, Kim Ogg has drawn the ire of some of the very far left uh, criminal justice reformers who don't believe in any pretrial incarceration whatsoever. And what Og recognized is that while she can support that misdemeanor bail reform that we've talked about, she's very much drawn the line when it comes to these violent offenders, repeat felony offenders, um, and releasing them on bond, creating a very dangerous situation in the community. And, uh, you know, she is right to point out that there is likely a conflict of interest. Lena Hidalgo and her staff are still under investigation. We had new Texas Ranger search warrants issued just a few months ago. They're still looking into Lena Hidalgo herself. For Sean Tier to uh, keep Lena Hidalgo's endorsement front and center, which is also the subject of a criminal complaint at this point uh, because it was done on county property and with county resources, um, that is very problematic. We're going to hear from both Marcus and Bob in overtime on this issue. Up next, what should we make of an attorney general who claims he never retaliated against whistleblowing employees but then concedes defeat? rather than testify under oath. Welcome back. 124 days after his controversial acquittal by the Texas Senate, Attorney General Ken Paxton raised the white flag of surrender in the multi-million dollar civil lawsuit brought against him by his whistleblowing former lieutenants. The decision by Paxton to no longer contest the facts of the case came soon after multiple court rulings compelling the state's top cop to give depositions under oath regarding allegations which formed the basis of several articles of impeachment, including retaliation, abuse of power, and violation of the Whistleblower Act. Panel, while the AG claims he's just moving to end wasteful litigation, House Prosecutor Andrew Murr says Paxton has, quote, dropped all pretense of innocence by dodging sworn testimony regardless of the cost. Marcus, take 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, th this, is, this is a sad, this is a sad day in the state of Texas, a sad day in Texas politics and in and, and U.S. politics. We had the show that was put on in the Texas uh, legislature, and now he's basically saying, yeah, I got away with it, so I'm going to do my O.J. dance right now. Bob Price, 30 seconds. O.J. dance, I like that. <laughs> so, the, Chairman Muir came out and basically said, I told you so. Um, five of, I think it was five of the counts of the impeachment were for abuse of power and items related to the Whistleblower Act. And now that the Attorney General's come out and said that he's not going to contest those allegations uh, as being factual or not factual. So, um, the House may have had it right. Uh, the the um, Documents weren't written well. The articles of impeachment weren't written well, so the Senate had a way to get out uh, under that. And and now we have this Republican civil war going on, where they're going after legislators based upon their votes in the in the impeachment hearing. Um, turns out he's probably going to have to do the depositions anyway. So I'm not sure what he gained here. <laughs> All right, Holly, uh, you look at this hard. <laughs> yeah, I usually make everybody mad when I talk about this because uh, I like to point out that <clears throat> excuse me, the impeachment was launched because of the request for a $3.3 million settlement to be paid by Texas taxpayers, and that prompted the House to look into the matter and see what was happening. Um, I have pointed out also, though, that by the time the impeachment took place, so we, these other issues have not been fully adjudicated, so we still have a court case here in Harris County over securities for and uh, we have the case of the whistleblower lawsuit. The legal actions that have taken place since the whistleblower lawsuit was reactivated
needed have all been designed to delay any deposition or further discovery in the case. This latest filing was pretty astounding. It did uh, basically say we're not going to fight the charges anymore. We'll let uh, the legislature try to settle this, but it's an attempt on the part of the attorney to uh, avoid these depositions and avoid putting Paxton and his key staffers on the stand. Um, this is a very clever move, but the judge wasn't having it. And uh, the judge has rejected that and has set dates for these depositions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd suggest that the attorney, but try as he might with that very hyperbolic filing, um, this attorney did not succeed here. All right. Talk more about it later. Still to come, that head shaking comment from Houston School Superintendent Mike Miles, who expressed regret for closing campuses during a day of life threatening weather conditions. On tonight's edition of Texas, the issue is airing right here on Fox 26 at 9 45. We examine the brutal civil war raging among our state's Republicans as far-right conservatives try to excommunicate House Speaker Dade Phelan and Phelan supporters respond back by punching in his defense. Speaker Phelan has proven himself passing constitutional carry, ending abortion, uh, you know, ending these woke drag shows and saving women's sports, making sure that men don't compete against our women in, in female sports from, from seventh grade through college. Uh, from conservative issue on conservative issue, no state in the country has had the massive conservative wins that we've had in the Texas House since he took over. This week, the nation's fourth largest city amazingly survived frigid life for threatening temperatures and treacherous icy roadways without a single weather related fatality, which made this statement by Houston ISD Superintendent Mike Miles about closing schools completely inexplicable, at least to me. Yeah, and it was, it was mine to make and I, and I made it. And I'm not sure it was the best decision. Uh, I think we missed an opportunity to develop a culture of essentialness. Panel, what he actually missed by choosing caution was the need to explain why a loaded school bus crashed on icy roads or why parents and teachers were needlessly injured on, uh, on roads that were covered with ice on their way to campus. Panel, agree or disagree, Sue? <laughs> I think the whole thing's void of common sense. I mean, I already made my decision at my house. We weren't getting on the roads, we weren't going to school, but a lot of parents had too. But in this instance, really, he's not the person in charge. This is about public safety. You know, our mayor, Mayor Whitmire, and the other leaders made the correct decision that for safety, we should stay at home, conserve energy, don't put anybody in danger's way. Our teachers are not first responders. They are not required to go to work in an emergency situation at all. And, and I, I just thought it was a, a really um, silly and um, unwise uh, remark he made. He should have gone along with everybody else and said it was the right thing to do. 15 seconds hard. <laughs> you know, I've, I've held out on, on this guy just based on trying to see what the outcomes regarding education would be, but this was a bonehead move. You know, just, you know, just you take precaution for caution's sake. All right. Caution say. People in Chicago are laughing their tails off at us. <laughs> because they're, they're, they're professionals thank you, that drive Thank you for joining us. The conversation continues on a national level next on Fox News Sunday with Shannon Bream. And we'll keep talking here with Watch Your Point Overtime, streaming live on our website and on Fox Local. So be sure to download the free app for your smart TV from all of us here. Have a safe and healthy week.